This is a geek leader. Hey, Geek Leaders, welcome to episode 150 of a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauda, and um, we are still in the midst of COVID-19 lockdown <laughs> where I'm at, and which means I'm recording this from my basement, and hopefully there's not going to be any of my three kids popping in, uh, interrupting this uh, this episode. But if so, hey, it is what it is, right? And we're all going to get through this together. We're going to work our, you know, our hardest and do our best. And um, one cool thing is that our sponsor today, Splashtop, who I talk about a lot because, again, they're our sponsors, and I've been using them for a long, long time. Um, are giving a special offer. You can go to a geekleader.com slash splashtop to get that special offer. And did you know you can use splashtop even from a Chromebook? So you can use a Chromebook with splashtop app to remotely access your work computer, whether it's a Windows, Mac, or PC computer. And Chromebooks are popular because of their features. You know, security, the price point's really cheap. And, you know, they're basically like a disposable machine because you know, you're not really saving anything on that Chromebook. It's all in the cloud. And with Splashtop, it's all on your Windows or Mac or Linux computer that's back at the office, right? With Splashtop, you can use a Chromebook to remote into your Windows, Mac, Linux, perform all the tasks as if you're sitting right in front of it. And you can do this with three easy steps. Just go to a geekleader.com slash Splashtop and try for free. There's a free trial, plus you can get 20% off. But purchase the Splashtop Business Access subscription, install the streamer agent on your work computer, and then download the Splashtop Android app for your Chromebook. And that's it. Then you can remotely uh, access and you know connect to that machine instantly without any lag. Just jump right on. You'll see your desktop. You'll be able to log in. You'll be able to manage it. And if you're using uh, Splashtop Business Pro, then you can also set features like uh, uh, access controls, such as who can access which computers, put computers in different groups, and all those cool things. So check that out for sure. Again, at geekleader.com slash Splashtop. All right, Geek Leaders. Today on the show, I've got Tristan White, and he's the founder and CEO of the Physio Co., which is a healthcare business. He's also... Um, been uh, an author of a book called Culture is Everything. He's got a program about culture, which is something that I think we all need to learn more about, how to be better team leaders and how to develop a culture with our team. And I'm definitely going to ask him some questions that I'm interested in. And hopefully you guys will uh, get some good knowledge and good information out of it. And one of the things that makes him kind of an expert in this field is the fact that his company has been uh, ranked as Australia's 50 best places to work. I think it's for like 10 years in a row, 11 years in a row now. Is that right? Yeah. Hey, John, great to be here. And it's, uh, yeah, we, we've uh, 11 years in a row, one of Australia's 50 best places to work is something we're pretty proud of. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, I know you had to get up early to, uh, to make my time slot, but I really appreciate it. And uh, if you don't mind telling the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are, why you founded PhysioCo and, um, and, and where, where, that's le- where that's led you so we can have some context for our conversation today. Yeah, absolutely, John. So my, my story is one that. uh, Started out uh, a couple of decades ago, my professional story, and that is that I'm a qualified physiotherapist, as we call it here in Australia, or physical therapist, as it's known in the States. And I had an early dream in my career to be a sports physiotherapist and work with elite sports people, um, especially Australian rules football here in Australia was a real dream of mine. And I graduated from from university. I started working in sports physiotherapy for about the first year of my career. I was working with an elite underage sports team. And I had a real challenge of head versus my heart, and meaning that my head um, really thought I was on the on the right path for my career, but my heart just wasn't in it. I didn't feel like I was I was serving the people in my community and in in, in I was doing my best work. And so I had an early pivot in my career. John and I stopped working with uh, with elite athletes, and I started working with much older people. And I became a physiotherapist, working with older people in aged care homes, in retirement villages, and in their own homes. And I just loved it. I just really felt like I was serving people and helping people, and being more valuable to the older clients than the elite athletes. Which was was quite embarrassing for me at the time because I was a a young a young person. I'd told everyone the elite sexy part of our industry was where I was headed and then all of a sudden I was working with older people in some pretty hidden little nursing homes Uh, but I just loved that work and I started I created a job for myself first with it working in a number of of aged care facilities I had more work than I could handle so I 
asked for some help, meaning that I started employing some part-time physical therapists, and then we built some momentum. And over time, John, I, uh, I built this little team of about, uh, after five years, there was about 20 of us that I'd become a physical therapist and then a manager. And somehow I'd become this accidental entrepreneur that um, had grown this little thriving business. Um, but, I, but I must say that that 20 person point in the early years, I got to a feeling of feeling completely stuck, completely surrounded by these team members who were reliant on me. I was a leader, but geez, I wasn't doing a very good job and I was really challenged. And that's where I really had to grow myself to be able to grow the team. And since that time, I've really focused on a period of grow, growing myself, becoming a better leader, growing this strong culture within our team. And, uh, and in the last decade, over the last 10 years, our team has grown significantly again. And we've got, uh, we built a team that got to a size of about 150 physical therapists all around Australia, serving thousands of older people to help them stay mobile, safe and happy. Is the, um, that's the professional, professional story, John. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I think your stories sounds very um, similar to, to stories that I've heard before where people feel like they, once you start leading people and you start gr- going through those growing pains, you do kind of feel stuck, right? Um, how is it that you were able to get, get past that feeling of stuck? Mm. So I had to ask for help, uh, John. That was something I, I had to do. And so, and probably before asking for help, I probably had to realize and, and admit that I had this problem that I wasn't uh, I wasn't perfect. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I, I reached out to some, for some help. I had some mentors that helped me to understand what my challenges were. And I also, I, I peered off in, in your direction, John. So I, I'm down here in Australia. Um, but when I wanted to, to research inside my industry of, of healthcare for older people, I, I looked up and I did some research into North America where the industry was a bit more advanced. And, uh, and I found some great examples of businesses that, ex- that had succeeded in our industry. And, uh, and that's when I, I found some mentors and I really did assess what, what I was doing well and what I, what I was not doing so well. So in short, I, I made sure I wasn't on my own and I looked for help from other people to guide me through what they'd done before me. Yeah, I think, I think finding a mentor is extremely important. And um, I've shared on the show how, you know, mentorship is kind of how I, I really developed as a leader because the company that I, when I first became a manager, I didn't really have, um, you know, leadership training. It was just like, Oh, now you're, man- now you're managing people, figure it out. And, hmm. um, you know, I kind of had to have that mentor that would guide me and give me suggestions and, you know, tell me that tough, those tough things that I needed to hear about the mistakes that I was making that, um, you know, other people wouldn't tell me. Yeah, look, it's, it's so important. And, um, I remember one of my mentors in those early years, uh, I was explaining a, a challenge I was having in the team that I was growing and, uh, and he listened closely and he understood. And then his, his question quite simply was, Tristan, is the problem not coming from the person that looks back from the, uh, the mirror? When you peer into the mirror uh, in the morning, when you get out of bed and peer into the mirror, is the problems you're describing, are they coming back from the person who's, uh, who's staring into the mirror at you? And, and maybe, just maybe, uh, that, was, um, that was a really important idea for me to be a responsible leader who always looks for a solution from within as a first point of call as opposed to blaming or expecting other people to be able to read my mind. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I know like uh, I had a very similar conversation <laughs> with my mentor at one point. I had two people quit on the same day and uh, I tried to blame, you know, use the excuse like, well, you know, the bank is really like we had a bunch of banks in, in the Charlotte area real close to our company. I'm like, well, they pay more and that's why they're all leaving because, you know, we can't match the salaries. And he's like, you know, people don't typically quit their jobs. They quit their bosses. Yeah, and mm. I was like, oh, that, that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, sometimes you got to hear that, right? You got to hear that, you know, the, the mirror is where the problem is. Mm, entirely. And I think that's for, for new leaders. I think that's really important that they hear that those words, uh, John, and that is that people don't quit their jobs. They quit their leaders because mm-hmm. they've lost trust. They've lost faith or they, or they've lost um, direction in their, in their career. And I think that's really important for all of us to realize. So what is it that a leader can do to help, uh, you know, build that trust or that teamwork or that culture with their team so that, uh, so that they, they don't lose their, their folks, you know? Mm. John, I think the, one of the most important things or important combination of skills that I think leaders need to have is, is a combination of being able to hold their team to account uh, and at the same time having a degree of empathy to connect with their team members. And so 
uh, in in the earlier times, we might have talked about being a boss or being a leader and not necessarily being too friendly or, or too connected to team members. And I think it's really important, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's really important that that leaders realize that they do have a job as the boss of the people in the team, but they do need to be a connected, accessible and friendly boss um, who is, has got a level of empathy and connection with their team. But at the team, at the same time, they are firmly holding people to account on the expectations. And I think that's a really important starting point for, for leaders to realize that yes, they need to be connected, but also they are expected to, uh, to provide direction, feedback and support for their team members. Do you find it um, sometimes challenging for people like if they fall into that, you know, that, that role of being a friend um, versus a leader or, or, or vice versa? Uh, entirely, entirely, especially uh, us. So myself as a, as a physical therapist, I, I was a trained technician. I was a, a team member. And then by default, I became a, a team leader. And it's very difficult to make that step uh, to, to move from being a member of the team and, and want to be, to be friends with the people in your team. And then all of a sudden, you're the person who's leading that team and, and having to hold them to account. And so, yeah, it is a difficult step. And that's a perfect time, in my experience, to have a mentor to be able to, uh, to guide you through that transition. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. I think that it's also hard, you know, sometimes when you, when you do make that transition from being a team member, you know, just one of the guys or gals that are there. And then now you're, um, you know, you're, you're leading and you feel like you've got to put some boundaries up, but sometimes you put those barriers a little too high and, and you lose some of that rapport and that, that trust that you had had before. What is the balancing act that has to go on there to, to keep the team culture and, you know, without, without disrupting things, I guess you would say. Yeah, it's a good point. No one wants to be a bossy boss. Right. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that um, the risk is for people that haven't had training and or experience is they become exactly either one of the two problematic um, options. And that is one is the bossy boss or the other one is the, the team leader who's still trying to be mates with everyone, trying to be friends with everyone in the team. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, it is difficult, but I think it's important that uh, team leaders, when they do progress to that area, that firstly, they realize that they're the two um, points of failure, if you will, and, and they should probably be connected enough with their team to, to ask for feedback and ask for feedback and say, uh, how am I performing as the leader of this team? And uh, of course, you need to ask for feedback from the right people because there are people in every single team usually that aren't the right people to get that type of feedback, but the level of trust with the people you do trust in the team, let's, let's ask for some feedback as to whether, yes, I am providing enough direction, enough support for this team, or am I being too bossy around this? And so I think we need to be brave and vulnerable leaders who ask for input from the people that have got the, the most information, and that is the team members. Yeah, so I, now here, here's where I need your help. So for me, you know, sometimes... Um, I've asked my team and sometimes people will give me the good, honest feedback. And sometimes they're like fearful. And I've tried to come up with ways to, to break down those walls, be vulnerable, you know, announce my own mistakes. Um, I've tried to take walking meetings so that we're not doing one-on-ones in my office, you know, we're doing them out in public. And there's still a few people that just, they refuse to criticize anything I do. And it's really hard for me to uh, take their feedback seriously if I can't get the negative stuff too, you know, Um, how is it you kind of break down those walls? Yeah, I, I think it's so. There's two two ways that I think it's really important, and, and one is that to be a really great listener in terms of hearing snippets of feedback that can happen in day to day conversations and day to day meetings. Because I think that if we if we are always got our ears open for hearing some things that people may let things slip or their guard may be down in a conversation about a project or about something that's happening within the team. I think as a leader, if we, if we hear those things, but then we don't follow up in public in that meeting, that's when we take that one-to-one, that talking, that walking meeting, if you will, and say, hey, can you tell me more about that? Let, let's, I'd like to understand some more and, and dig deeper um, in, in a one-to-one private situation, but about a specific example that you've heard come out of uh, that person's mouth. And I think that it doesn't work every time, uh, John, because you're right. Some people are closed and they're very fearful of providing feedback. But I think if you've got a practice of hearing things and then taking it offline in a one-to-one way to ask for specific feedback under the premise 
that you want that person to thrive and you want to also understand how you can improve yourself, then I think that type of approach with the right people can really help you to, to dig deep on that feedback. Yeah, like asking asking why and why, kind of kind of getting digging in a little yeah. bit deeper about the reasons behind it and, and how how you can improve because you want this to be um, yeah yeah. And, and John, well. I think um, John, I think there's a, a really great book for for leaders who um, so, so we haven't used the word coach just just yet, but I'm I'm one hundred percent committed that um, leaders need to be coaches of the people in their team Mm -hmm. Uh, it's one of the most important skills that um and to realize that you're not necessarily the boss or the leader or the manager even if that's your job title but you are the coach of the people in your in your team and you need to ask questions and guide people to their their best performance and um and a book that would be really useful that i really enjoyed is a book called the coaching habit uh and it's inside the coaching habit uh, by a fellow called michael Bungay Stanya is his name. I hope I'm um, pronouncing that correctly. But I'll um, link it up in the but, show notes as well. For yeah, it. that's good. But the coaching habit, and it's got a seven-step uh, series of questions to really help new leaders understand the the series of questions they can ask to get to the bottom of the of the situation. And um, for example, one of the questions in the in the seven steps is, and what else? And because when you ask and what else, it enables people to go a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. And even one of the questions it suggests is, what's the real problem here? What's the real challenge? And it really helps people to firstly get something on, uh, start the conversation, but then go a bit deeper and then to really try and summarize and define the, the challenge or the, or the opportunity to improve. And so, yeah, check that out. I reckon that would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just, um, I just pull that up and I'm going to link that up in the show notes. And uh, I, I definitely think that would be helpful. And I like that question, you know, and, and what else, you know, because there's always going to be something else. There's always something more. And if you can get that little bit more information, that kind of makes them more comfortable sharing it because they were to give a little bit more. Why not, why not just a little bit more, you know? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I, I liked about your book, and I, and I went to your website and I pulled up, I downloaded this, um, uh, Culture is Everything, 19 Steps to Building a Great Place and Work. Uh, what, what, are the, what are those 19 steps and how do you break that up? Because I think you break it up into different, uh, different categories kind of. Is that right? Yeah, look, it is. And so the Culture is Everything checklist is what you're talking about. And some, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the 19 steps to building a great place to work. And, and so I'll tell you where this came from, John, the, the background, and that is that um, – that I was building the physio co and I got completely stuck and completely stressed when we had that little team. And then I was able to discover a way to, to move forward and keep growing. And um, in the years that followed, uh, we started winning these uh, awards for being one of Australia's best places to work. And, uh, and people started asking me how they said, Tristan, how do you become one of Australia's best place to work? What's the secret to building a strong culture? And um, I would give them this long, drawn-out answer that would make some sort of sense to me, John, but, um, but my goodness, they couldn't follow. It made no sense to anyone else. And so to try and solve that problem to be a better communicator, I, I documented all the little steps that we'd put in place bit by bit by bit within our team, which had helped us to build a stronger culture and then start winning these awards and it turns out that there were 19 steps that I could uh, I could really define as the things that I'd learned, I'd considered, I'd applied, and then I'd, I'd repeat, used over and over again to build a strong culture in our team. And um, the 19 steps to building a great place to work is the um, is the outcome, and it's broken up into four sections um, that I describe as: firstly, discover the core and really understand. What, what your business is about or what your team's about, and that's about having a really compelling core purpose. Um, and in the checklist, I describe it as, do you have a short and easy to understand core purpose as opposed to a wishy-washy mission statement, uh, which is uh, often what we see. So four parts, um, four part checklist, discover the core, which is about having a compelling core purpose and a set of memorable core values um, or behaviors that the team sort of uh, gravitates around. Uh, the second part of the of the checklist is document the future, making sure it's very clear where you're headed, both in the longer term that we learned from Jim Collins in his book called Good to Great. He talks about a big, hairy, audacious goal, and I call that a ten year obsession. Uh, and then, but then reverse engineering and breaking down that that vision to milestones uh, that I call three year painted picture uh, milestones or stepping stones. Uh, and so that's the first part of the first two parts: discover the core and then document the future. The next part of the the checklist is called execute relentlessly. 
And this is the repetition. This is keeping the system alive over and over and over, including an energetic set of, of communication rhythms, uh, daily huddles being a really important part of that, and also making sure that we've, we've got robust recruiting processes that we use to execute relentlessly on getting the right people into our team and the wrong people out if they are no longer a, a culture fit. And the very last part of the, of the section, John, is called show more love. And it's really about making sure you've got a systemized approach to recognition and reward and, and empathetically connecting with team members on things that go well for them, but also making sure you've got a system to connect with people when things are not going work, going well, uh, especially at home in their, in their personal lives. When we, when we get snippets of things not going so well, we need to lean in in a respectful, non-prying way to really connect with our, with our team members. And so they're the four parts of the culture of everything system. Mm, that's good. And I like that last part too, because we got to realize that people are people and, you know, when things are going, you know, re- the reason why we work is for our home, right? It's, it's for the family, the people that we have at our house. That's, that's, that's the whole why behind most of what we do. And when something's going wrong there, you know, whether it's a, a sick dog, a sick kid or, or, or anything else, we need to understand that that will bleed into the life that we have at work too. And, um, mm. you know, you can't just, you can't just have that thing where you just leave it all at the door, you know? Yeah, look, John, that's entirely true. As much as, much as the concept of leave home at home and, and work at work is a, is a wonderful theory, it's uh, as human beings, it's 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 really not possible. I don't, I don't think. Um, and I think that that show more love section is something that I've learned over time. I didn't realize the connection between the care and um, understanding a leader can have on their team members. But um, there's one example that um, that is in the book. Culture is everything. And uh, we had a, an accountant in my team uh, a number of years ago and his wife was pregnant expecting her their, their first baby and she became quite unwell and she was rushed to hospital. And, um, and of course, Riddick, our accountant, had some time off from work and he rushed to her bedside and, and he was there and, and we did the only thing that we thought was appropriate and that was give him, give him some space, stay in touch, send a bunch of flowers to his wife's uh, hospital bed to say, thinking of you, get, get well soon, we, we, all our love from the team at the Physio Co. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and look, she turned out to be fine, the baby was born, no problems and, um, and Riddick returned to work. But that's, uh, that family was blown away by the fact that her husband's, uh, the, the lady's husband's boss and team had sent flowers to the bedside it was quite uh, overwhelming for them. They'd never even received it from her boss, let alone from her husband's boss. And I think that small things can um, have a big, big impact, John. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're 100% right. And, you know, I really like the fact that in that checklist, you have something like make sure you have a good budget for things like that. Because that's one of the things that, you know, if, if every time you have to go around and try to collect donations or something for someone, you know, it's so much easier if you just say, hey, look, let's just go send flowers and let's do it out of our budget. And, you know, let's take care of this person. Let's give them a meal if their you know, spouse is sick and they're at home, you know, or, or whatever we need to do to take care of them. I think that makes so much more sense. Yeah, it does. And it's so simple. Like in, in our little team, uh, John, and, and so, some businesses need uh, smaller budgets and some business, businesses need bigger budgets. But um, we've, we've got someone who is um, constantly on this looking for the uh, opportunities to, to embrace with our team members. And um, effectively, uh, this person has got a promise that they will um, likely send a bunch of flowers or similar, a hamper or the like, most weeks. It costs about $80 per week, 50 odd weeks of the year. It's about $4,000 in total. And to connect and show our care and love for our team members, it's $4,000, which is very well spent. Very, very, yeah, very well. This is very reasonable, you know, to, to, yeah. to you know, be able to, um, but basically you're doing it for employee retention. Just, you know, if you wanted to get down to the, you know, it's really more than that. I get that. But if you wanted to justify it with an ROI, employee retention easily pays for itself uh, with something yeah. like that. Uh, no question, John. And then look, if, if really, uh, I think there's, we build cultures for much more, many reasons than um, the commercial outcomes. I think it's, right. um, there's much more to it than that. But if you really want to get down to it, if, we, um, if we're sitting here with the accountants, uh, so to speak, culture really can contribute to cash uh, down the line with the, with the right approach um, via, in that example, retention and the costs of having to, um, to find someone new, retrain them, all, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I've been uh, hearing a lot about culture lately. And I think, uh, I think maybe you were a little bit ahead of the curve on, on some of this stuff, which is awesome. But, um, 
you know, we heard about it with Netflix a while back that their culture is kind of what helped help them become, you know, this global leader of entertainment. And, you know, what you're doing too with your team, as far as culture is concerned and helping others, you know, get to that point too. Um, how is it that you can take what you do with, with your team and have that also work in technology and also work, you know, in uh, healthcare and in finance and in other groups as well? How have you systemized that to where, to where you've proven that, it, that it's, uh, you know, reusable? Yeah. So, so look, I think um, what, what's really important here is is this culture is everything checklist that we're speaking about, which um, of course people can download from my, my website, and we can um, we can pop that in the in the show notes to, mm-hmm. to check it out. Uh, but the very the earlier versions of this uh, of this checklist were very specific to to our business and very specific to healthcare. Um, and I've I've worked hard to to work with other industries understand the the language and the differences between the healthcare industry and and then technology as an example or professional services education is another industry that's really embraced this culture as everything checklist and so the language <clears throat> the language that's used in the checklist is, is much now applicable to other industries and other um other businesses uh however the, the system is is stretchable to other industries, but as people work through the system, work through the checklist and apply it to their business, they need to be very specific about the language and the specifics of their industry and how they can tweak it and tailor it to really bring it to life in their business. You can't have a carbon copy of what we're doing in our business in health and apply it exactly into technology. You have to engage with the system, think through what are you learning from healthcare, how does this apply to our business, and then how do we implement this step on the checklist based upon those um, your specific industry and team. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I'm, when I'm looking through this, I'm like, wow, all this stuff kind of fits. And I kind of see some of the things that I'm doing wrong too, that I probably should clean up a little bit <laughs> you know, as, as well. Like you talk about the three to five core values. I think I have like 10. <laughs> so I probably yeah. need to limit that down to make it more memorable. Um, and there's things I can combine. There's things I can do to improve. And I think that's the whole point, right? It's to always be improving and always be, um, you know, refining and modifying what you're doing with your team to, uh, to improve this culture that you have. Yeah, that, that's right. And look, to, to speak to that specific point of three to five core values, if you expect people to to live the core values, they've got to be able to remember them. Yeah. And that's why between three and five is the right number. And, and to talk to the point of continuous improvement, um, one of those three to five core values in, in the physio co business, our healthcare business, we have four core values. And one of them is simply called find a better way. And, um, and we are continuously finding a better way and uh, whether it's the, the clinicians, the healthcare uh, people providing care or whether it's my, the executive team that I work with, we, we just live that over and over and over again. I like that. Find a better way. I might steal that for, for my team as well. Well, it is awesome. borrowed. Yeah. I, I, can tell, I can tell you that there's, we've got four core values, three of them we did coin ourselves and the fourth one, which is find a better way. We, we found it somewhere else. We tried to tailor it to ourselves and we just could not come up with anything better. So we, we borrowed it as it was. Yeah. I have, I have something similar. I say make the complex simple, but I like this better. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, no, this is this has been really cool. Um, so let's say I'm I'm struggling as a new manager, new boss, and I need something to kind of get me started. I know you have this cultures everything Kickstarter program. Tell me a little bit about that and how that could help me if I was struggling. You know, get getting things in line and getting my team up to where I felt like they needed to be, and me as a leader, you know, to get me to where I need to be for my team. Yeah, for sure. So look, it's it can be overwhelming as a new leader and, and how to build a strong strong culture. And then I've got this 19-step system. But again, 19 steps can be quite overwhelming if you, you're like, goodness, where do I start? And so what I've created is a, is a 19-week online program. And if people um, sign up to the program, then over 19 weeks, I, I deliver them, I drip feed them the information from the, the program. There's 19 emails delivered once a week over that period. And in each email, there is a short podcast or um, audio lesson to listen to. There is a, a either a chapter of my book or an article to, to read. And there's one to three actions to take that week, which is based upon implementing that step in the checklist. And then over time, I can guide people through how to understand the importance of building a strong culture, how to take action in their team, and how to slowly but surely build the system to have a repeatable system to build a strong culture within their team. And, and that's how the program works, John. 
Awesome. And I think that's so important for people to realize that just because you become a boss or a manager, you're, you're not done. That's kind of like starting point. And you've got to learn and train and continue to grow and improve and find courses like this that are out there to help you get to that next level. Otherwise, you're just going to fall behind and not be a good leader for your people. And one of the, the roles as a leader is, you know, we have to care for our people. We have to be there for them. We have to improve their lives in some way or another. And if we're not doing that, then we're going to fall short in our duties and our goals and our, our life as well. Yeah, I, I, entirely, entirely. And the, the, the challenge with a team that doesn't have a strong culture is, it's, is there's lots of reactivity and, and what I call rework mm. and rework as a leader is doing the same thing over and over again. It's rehiring, it's retraining, it's rehiring, it's retraining, it's recommunicating. And I, I've been in tough times like that myself and it's, it takes over your life and your health can be affected. Your family life can be affected. There's so many things that can be challenged if your, if your team is not, uh, not performing. So uh, slowly but surely building a strong team culture is one of the most important things I've done to create time and space in my life to firstly be able to grow my team, but also to be able to have the, the space in my life to be able to engage properly with my, with my wife and my children and my community. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I think uh, what you just said, rework as a leader is one of those things that I've never heard it put that way, but you're absolutely right. When you have that weak leadership, you have people that are quitting a lot. You have a lot of turnover. You're, you're always searching for new candidates and hiring. And it's like, man, if I could just keep my team intact for, you know, for a full year or two years, then I don't have to worry about that. And, um, once I got to the point of my last, last job, um, I had the highest turnover rate in the company for, you know, about a three year period. And I was able to you know, turn that around to not have any turnover for three years and the amount of, you know, work that we were able to get done and the amount of time that I was able to like not stay late at the office and get home on time for dinner. Um, and the amount of time I was able to take off and go do things with my kids, you know, increased significantly because I didn't have to spend time stressing over hiring the next person or what are we going to do? Cause we're short a person on, on this team and we're going to get behind on the, the work and I have to go report that to the business and so on and so forth. Yeah, look, it's there is it just takes over your life when you have a team that's not performing. Uh, John, I, I understand that, and and even in our team that has been winning awards as one of Australia's best places to work, we've had one team leader who's been having a really tough time in terms of um, of retaining the right people, or firstly selecting the right people, and then retaining the right the the right people. And and she's uh, been doing it tough, and we're, we've been leaning in to support her, and now that she's gradually there's light at the end of the tunnel there's two new team members started yesterday and she's really is, is building this and i explain that because even once the system is in place there are still ups and downs as you go but in general this system can create more stability um in the, in the business as a whole yeah for sure so um well, I want to say thank you for first for uh, you know getting up early because you're in Australia to, to, to have this call. <laughs> but uh, you guys have had kind of a tough, uh, tough, su- or tough, you know, uh, past couple of months with the fires and things. Is there anything that our listeners could do to help out, or um, is there any, you know, how's that going down there? Yeah, look, thanks for mentioning it, John. It's really, really kind of you to 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 acknowledge it, and it's been a tough time. And so I'm in I'm in a place called Gippsland, which is a region of um, of Australia, the most southeastern part of the Australian mainland. And um, and we've had some pretty bad fires down here. My my mother lives about two hours drive from me, and she had to be uh, evacuated for a, for a few nights from her house. Fortunately, uh, the fire didn't um, didn't destroy her house, but um, it's been a really tough time. And but things are going better. We've um, we've had some rain. With the the fires are now more in control, especially in the um, in the habitated areas at some mm. in some national parks and in some forests. They're certainly still still burning. Uh, but look, if people would like, wanted to um, to support the uh, uh, the recovery, I, I guess then there are some um, some wonderful uh, Gippsland Emergency Relief Fund. G E R F is Gippsland Emergency Relief Fund, which is local to my area here. If people want to contribute to donate there, that would be one way. Um, alternatively, just keep us in your in your mind and keep us in your in your thoughts as we um, do everything we can to um to to bounce back. Absolutely. I'm going to link uh, gerf.org.au in the uh, show notes as well. So people can go there if they, you know, feel, um, you know, like they want to contribute in, in, in another way, but we'll definitely keep you guys in our thoughts. I know there's been um, a horrific amount of animals that have been affected as well as people um, with the, the, uh, the fires down there. So we definitely want to you know, remember you guys, cause it is kind of a, a crazy uh, uh, scenario that, that went on. 
Mm, yeah, thank you, John. Much appreciated. And how can people uh, connect with you and find out more about Cultures Everything, your book, and uh, and your program? Yeah, so look, the um, the place to find me on the web is my personal homepage. It's tristanwhite.com.au is the uh, the website. Uh, we can pop that in the show notes. But um, but also if people Google culture is everything, they will find me, they'll find my book. Uh, and that's probably a, as easy a place to find me as anything is to Google culture is everything. And of course, you can find me in all the usual social places of um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. My handle is at Tristan J. White is my handle in, um, in most of those places. Awesome. And I'll link all those up in the show notes as well as your podcast, which um, I've had to listen to. I think it's great. I love your guests. You've had some awesome people on. You've had, you kind of have like a, a, a two, two part show. You have, you know, you know, your guests and then you have your solo shows and it's really good. The, the mix of it, I think it's excellent. Yeah. Thank you, John. The, the Think Big Act Small podcast is, um, is something I've been working on for the last couple of years and yeah, partly learning from others with interviews and partly sharing my learnings in the solo shows. So, um, so yeah, it's been, been good fun. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome, John. Have a great day. All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that show with Tristan. And if so, please share it with all your friends, share it on social media, share it wherever you can share things because downloads are important. We want to get the word out there. We want to give people stuff to do too and some encouragement during this uh, COVID-19 time, especially if you're locked up like me in your house and you're probably getting a little stir crazy or having a little bit of cavernous fever, hopefully not having any Corona fever. But if you are, um, you know, definitely seek help, uh, stay quarantined. Please do not spread this thing. If you can, if you can, uh, you know, do what you can to to help that, that'd be awesome. Also, I want to encourage everyone to uh, leave a rating and review. Those things are helpful, and now you might have a little bit more time on your hand. Unless you're like me and you have three kids plus trying to work remotely, uh, it can be kind of stressful and, and time-consuming. And if so, hey, I get it. That's cool. Um, do your best. We're, we're all in this together. We're all to get through this, and hopefully we'll be stronger as a society, as a nation, and as a group together. We'll come out of this um, being more grateful for the things that we have, and just take a few minutes and be grateful. Think about all the cool stuff. And don't forget about our sponsor, Splash Top. Uh, thank them as well. Thank them on Twitter, or LinkedIn, or wherever you can. And definitely try it out at geekleader.com slash Splash Top so you can remotely access your machines and work from home uh, if you have to, like like I do right now, as in lockdown. And um, again, thanks a lot for all the support. I've got some great messages um, during this time of COVID-19, and it's encouraging. Keep those coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks a lot. Stay safe out there.